We're going to start a Christmas series. It's a four-week Christmas series. Um, and the reason it's four weeks is there's four times in the story of Christmas where somebody's told, do not be afraid. So the series is about fear. Okay. And we're going to hear, we're going to, today it's a story about Zechariah. In Zechariah, in his life, there's a moment that he's afraid. There's fear that comes over his body. So I'm going to get straight into the, 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 the word today because there's a lot of verses we're going to read. So if you have your Bible, your app, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 25, and we'll have the verses on the screen. All right. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And they were wondering at, this, at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was able, unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when, and when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, for the, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Okay. A lot of words here, a lot of, so we're going to break this up in certain sections, little subtitles. So we're going to take the first part of this verse, and we're going to, the couple, right? Let's learn a little bit about Zechariah and Elizabeth. And these are verses 5 through 6. And real quick, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So, this is Zechariah. He's a father of John the Baptist. Now, of course, we know John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. Zechariah is an old man. And he's married, and his wife's name is Elizabeth. And she's also advanced in years. They were both godly people, right? They had faith in God for many, many years. And Zechariah has been a priest most of his life. Uh, the scripture says, again, that this couple was both righteous in the sight of God, right? They observed the commandments blamelessly. And so they were upright people. Now, if we, just because I, we call them blamelessly and righteous does not mean they're perfect. By no means. That just means they're godly people. People. That means they're everything they do, they say, right? They think they're trying to please God. Same way today is for us Christians. Everything we do, right? We're trying to please God. Okay? And so they had a good reputation in the community. Of course, God knew who they were. So now let's let's talk about the little problem that they saw in their lives. All right, so verse 7. 
It says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Elizabeth was barren, right? And she had no, she was unable to conceive and they were both very old. There's some commentators say that they believe they were in 70s or 80s, right? Well past their childbearing years. But we need to understand that during the first century in Israel, the surrounding uh, cultures in that area, if you were childless, um, if you were barren, um, that was considered a great reproach, okay? Um, also, another commentator said to be childless during that time, it affected you negatively um, economically and socially, okay? Economically because you, as a parent, you had no children to, to help you when you got old, to take care of you. Socially because when people knew that you weren't able to conceive a child, um, they would look at both of you and judge you, that you had sin, that you must have done something so bad that God didn't bless you with a child. We probably, as much as we can try to imagine, we can't imagine during that time the humiliation, the, the sadness, the uh, disappointment, the shame that Elizabeth and Zechariah must experience. But we got, I got to take it aside and give credit to Ze Zechariah because Zechariah could have divorced his wife, but he stayed married. Because during that time, if your wife was unable to have a child, it was approved for grounds for divorce. Zechariah could have left Elizabeth, married somebody else, had a child with his new wife, and for him it would have felt like this, this curse off his back. That's what a lot of men did, but not Zechariah. Right? He had faith in God, he had faith in his vows, and he had faith in his wife. So he stayed married. So we have this old couple, right? That there's shame, there is the sorrow of, of, of barrenness, but check this out. God chooses them to be the parents of John the Baptist, right? This, this messenger who's going to announce to the whole world the Messiah. So whatever people might have thought of them, it didn't matter. What, what mattered was how God views them. Because how God views you is different how the world views you, how society views you. And what's most important than anything is how God views you. But you may feel this morning like a social outcast. Maybe you feel some shame for something you did that you feel like it's your fault or not your fault. Maybe you had some uh, great disappointment in your life. You, maybe you, you may not be as successful as your siblings. You may not come from the, the best background or the, or the best family. You may have a, a disability. Maybe you're not the prettiest. Maybe you're not the strongest. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've never been married. But listen, none of that matters. I mean, don't think God can't use you because of a disability you have or where you live or your social status. None of that matters. What matters is how God sees you. When he looks at you, what does he see? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are in Christ, what he sees is a righteous man or a righteous woman. Okay? That's what God sees. God sees a person that is, is clothed in the righteousness of his son. He sees a son. He sees a daughter of his. He sees somebody that, died, that Christ died for. He sees a vital part of the body. That's what God sees when you're in Christ. Now, God wants to use you. Maybe not exactly the same way he's going to use, uh, the way he used Zachariah and Elizabeth or Mary and Joseph, but he's looking for people who their hearts are available, have completely given their heart to his son, Jesus. All right, so now we're going to move on to the opportunity. Okay, this is what happens when Zechariah is performing his, his uh, priestly duties in the temple. So verses 8 through 10, it says, Now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So, Zechariah is a priest. During that time, about 20,000, give and take, priests were at serving the temple. 
His division served the temple two weeks out of the year. And by some chance, right, once in a lifetime, he will be chosen to, do, to be part of the daily offering in the holy place. Well, this honor fell on him that day by lot, meaning similar like drawing straws, okay? But I want you to understand, God chose him to be there, right? It is no coincidence when it comes to God. So Zechariah's job was to uh, offer incest. Burning coals were put on the, uh, on the altar of incest. And then, all of a sudden, then the priest would enter the holy place bearing the golden censer. And what they'll do then, they would spread the incense over the coals. And then all of this cloud of fragrance would come from the altar. And with the prayers of all the worshipers outside, it was a beautiful, symbolic experience of worship. Okay? So, God chose Zechariah to be in that room in the Holy of Holies. We're going to move on to the appearance. Let's see what this amazing thing that happens to Zechariah. This is uh, verse 11 to 12. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. So, while Zechariah was burning the incense, and while he was praying, all of a sudden, he opens his eyes, and he sees an angel. Now, he probably, if it was me, I probably went that way a second. The guys didn't tell me about this, right? And nobody told me. It wasn't in the pamphlet that someone's going to be standing there next to the altar, right? And his, my mind, when I'm pretty sure his mind was going 100 miles an hour, all of a sudden just, you start thinking, oh my, God is here. There's an angel here. And fear fell upon him, pressed on him. He was overwhelmed with terror. I couldn't even imagine what that would have been like um, for Zechariah. Because when we think of angels, we usually think of little chubby babies, don't we? With, with wings, right? Well, with a harp and a bow and an arrow, like Cupid. But when it comes to God's angels, they're powerful creatures, okay? They're called ministers. They carry swords. And in 2 Kings chapter 19, it says that God sent one of his angels to the camp of the Assyrians, and they killed 185,000 men in one night. They're warriors. They are to serve God and do every command he asks. And every time an angel appears in the Bible, appears to somebody, usually we see that person's face hit the ground as fast as you can. So I think we can kind of give Zachariah a little slack here, right? Because he was a little afraid. I would have been too. All right, so now let's move on to the promise, okay? Let's see what this angel has to say. Verse 13 through 17. It says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Okay, so the angel says, right, do not be afraid. Other verses says, fear not in King James. Right, Zechariah, don't be afraid for your prayer has been heard. So whatever the angel is about to say, it's going to calm Zechariah a little bit. He's not going to be as, as afraid anymore. So what was a prayer? I know we might think was a prayer was for a child, right? Well, at first glance, we might think that. But in a minute, I'm going to read verse 18. You're going to realize that he gave up on that prayer a long time ago about having a child. What he's been praying for, what the whole nation has been praying for, was the coming of the Savior. They've been praying for God to send the Redeemer. And that's what the angel was telling him, because that's what they've been praying for a long time, for salvation. They wanted God's help. But what does God do also? He says, you know, I'm going to give you this personal prayer they used to have a long time ago. And again, he probably stopped praying for this prayer because 
of his age. You don't see that many citizens. I don't hear many citizens telling me, I want to have a child that's 70 years old. He probably prayed for a long time when he, from when he was married, young, prayed, prayed, prayed for a child, passionately prayed to God. But at some time in their life, they just, you know what? God has not blessed us, but that's okay. We're still going to love God. And what does God do? God says, I'm going to give you a child. And that child I give you, he's going to prepare the people for the Messiah. So God decides to go ahead and tackle two requests with one, all right? One personal and one national. So the angel told Zechariah that his, that his son is going to be named John. And he quotes this from the last book of Malachi in the Old Testament. In fact, this, what he's quoting here is the last two verses in the Old Testament. And those verses is five through six. In the book of Malachi chapter four is what it says. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Least I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. So these were the closing words of the Old Testament. These are the words by God through the prophet Malachi. 400 years before Zechariah. Right? Not a word was, God hasn't spoken a word over 400 years. Not even angelical visitation, nothing but silence. Then all of a sudden, this angel Gabriel appears. Right? The last time we heard about Gabriel was in the book of Daniel. And he decides to appear because God sent him to this old pastor, Zechariah. Now he tells him this child, John, that you're going to have, he will be great in the sight of the Lord, he tells him. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit when he's in his mother's womb. And he's going to come in the, in the spirit and the power of Elisha. Now you would think that Zechariah would be overjoyed at this point, right? I mean, you would think he'd be like, oh, hold up, repeat everything after you said I'm going to have a child. Because I wasn't really paying attention after that, right? Because this is something that he's, he's hopeful for a long time. Some, a hope that he's forgotten. But this is better than what he could ever hope for and ask for, right? I mean, not only is he going to have a child, he's going to have a son. And that son's going to be a great prophet. And that prophet is going to prepare the way for a greater child. I mean, that was great news for Zechariah. God's answers are always better than what we expect. Every single time. Better than we could ever imagine, we could ever think. His answers are better. No matter how Zechariah lives, they could have sat around with 30 people in their wildest imagination and think, what can we ask God? And they couldn't think of, well, wait a second. Let me ask God to give me a child. Because everybody knows that I'm barren and I can't have a child. That will be a blessing. And let that child, God, let that child, my child, be the way that prepares for the Savior. And let that one be your child, God. No way they could have thought of that. No way. But that's how God works, doesn't he? That's how amazing God is. And Paul writes that in the, in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. He says this. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or all we can think according to that power. Watch this out. The according to the power that works within us. Isn't that amazing? That the work that he, that power that's within us. To him glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So you may be here this morning thinking, what about me? God hasn't come and answered my prayer. Maybe you're fearful and there's disappointment like Zachariah. You may feel that way this morning. Maybe there's shame and humiliation like um, Elizabeth. But listen, God always has the best plan. His will is good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect, okay? God has a greater plan than your limited perspective has ever known to hope for. 
Now, it might not end up the way you want it to end up. It might not be what you think is the best solution. It may be difficult. It may include some suffering. You might have to wait for a long time. But his plan is always the best. And God has a greater plan than your limited perspective has ever known to hope for. Amen. But we have to trust that. We have to trust that God's plan is best. And that's where sometimes we struggle. It's that word trust. We just got to trust in God. He knows you. He knows you, the beginning of you and knows the end of you. He knows what's going to happen on every decision you make, where it's going to, what road you're going to go. Right? He does. I was watching uh, this little uh, series. It was a Christian series about Jesus, how he appears to different people's lives. And there was one episode I saw that they're robbing this uh, gas station, these three guys. And one of the guys in the very back, and Jesus is the, the clerk. And he starts talking to the guy in the back while he's trying to get in the vault, trying to get the cash. And Jesus is talking to him and slowly, you know, tells him stuff that he, how does this guy know who I am? And eventually tells him I am a Jesus. And the guy starts getting upset. Well, where are you at when you were here? Where were you at when you were here? And then there's a wall. The wall right here, there's pictures. And Jesus says, I want you to look at this. And the guy looks at the pictures, and it has his future if he continues to do that crime. If he doesn't stop what he's doing, and, and it shows a picture of his unborn son, that his wife's pregnant, and he's not going to have a father. And it shows a picture of him in jail, him as an old man with no family. Then he turns, turns to the guy and says, but listen, if you stop this right now, and you turn yourself in, Look at these pictures now. And all of a sudden, these pictures were of his future with his child, with his wife, as an old man with his family, smiling. See, Jesus knows what's going to happen to us on every decision. It'll be amazing if Jesus will come to us, right? Each one of us. Listen, this is what you got to do. You do this, this is the right road. But that's why we have to trust. We have to trust his ways are always the best. Amen? So if he doesn't give you a child or a father or a, a husband or a wife or a family, a job or a retirement, if he doesn't give you those things you asked for, you got to continue to trust in Jesus. All right, so let's go to the response now. So how does Zechariah respond to this amazing news, right? This amazing news that he's been praying for a long time, stop praying, but still great news for him. Verse 18 says this, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Come on, Zechariah. Is this the best you can do? I mean, Zechariah, though a man of God, was still a man. Right? But like, but like most of us, most, most of everybody here, we've doubted God. We've doubted God before in our life. We've questioned God's promises. And what Zechariah is asking, he's asking for more evidence. He's asking, he says, how shall I know this? And then he decides to remind Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, if you didn't notice, let me tell you this problem I have. The fact that they're old. And Zechariah is like, he's not, uh, uh, Gabriel is not blind. He can tell that he's old and his wife is in advancing years. And I, I got to take a step here. God, man, I know he said advancing years. Okay, Zachariah. But we should never mention our wife's name and say old in the same sentence, right? <laughs> Not even trying to clean it up like and say advancing years, stricken in years. We just should never do that, okay? Um, that's right. So instead of looking to God by faith, what does Zechariah do? Zechariah, this old priest, looks at himself, looks at his wife, and says, this idea of having a child at my age is impossible. He, needed, he wanted more assurance. He wanted a sign beyond the plain words of God's messenger. What, did he forget that God blessed 
Abraham and Sarah to have a child at their old age? I mean, did Zechariah really think that his physical limitations would hinder the Almighty God to fulfill his plans? Now, his response might surprise us, but it really shouldn't. Because there's been times in our life that we have moments of disbelief. We have moments of weakness. We have moments of doubt. We have moments of sin in our lives. So before we criticize Zechariah too much, again, we need to ask ourselves, do we ever doubt God? Right? Do we ever question God and thinking, well, I don't know if he can solve this difficult situation in my life. Do you ever read the Bible and think, huh, I don't know if I can swallow that story. I think, I don't know if that's true or not. Do we ever do that? So my prayer is instead of responding the way Zechariah did, that we're going to respond the way Abraham did. When Abraham was told that he was going to have a son with, with uh, his wife Sarah, and he was going to be known as the father of Israel, right? His faith did not waver. His faith got stronger. He gave glory to God, right? So I just pray that we respond more like that because Abraham knew that God had the power to fulfill his promises. Amen? All right, so the rebuke. Let's see how Gabriel responds to Zechariah's unbelief here. So 19 to 20 says this. And the, ang and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you good news. And behold, you will be silent and I and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So the angel now identifies himself and says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Wow. What credentials, right? Amazing credentials. I am Gabriel. This is the one that he probably read about in Daniel, chapter 8 and chapter 9. Right? Doubtly, he is a high-ranking angel, Gabriel. He's not just texting and emailing God. He's continuing to stand in the presence of God and doing every will that God wants him to do. And he sent him to go talk to Zechariah and to tell him what's to come. To, to disbelieve Gabriel right, is to doubt God himself. And with this rebuke, uh, Zechariah is dumbfounded. He can't speak for nine months. And he can't hear either because in verse 62 it says that the people were making signs to Zechariah to communicate with him. Now you might think Zechariah got a bad rap here because if you think about it, Sarah <coughs> laughed at the idea that she was going to have a child at her old age. Right? And Gideon didn't believe God's word if, that he was going to deliver the people out of Israel. Okay, but nothing happened to them like this. So what's up with that? Well, we need to understand that God can do whatever he pleases to us, right? But he's a good God, though. He's always a good God. He sees your heart, so he knows what you need. He knows that if you need kindness, right? He knows if you need encouragement. He knows if you need um, help. But he also knows when sometimes we need a two by four alongside of our face. <laughs> Evidently, in the case of Zechariah, he needed to shut up for nine months, didn't he? But that was God's chosen method to discipline Zechariah for his unbelief. And now Zechariah can look at that sign because he wanted a sign, right? So he got a sign, but it was a gracious sign because now he knows God's word is true and is going to be fulfilled. Amen. Now, this was a discipline. It's not a punishment. Okay, we have to know the difference. Right? God, I mean, God disciplined Zechariah to, in order to love him, to teach him, to heal him, right? to restore him. And it, he does the same for you and me. Right? When God disciplines us, he does it for our good. He does it for our holiness. The scripture says that God is working out your salvation your sanctification. It may seem strange. It may seem difficult at times. And listen, it may even feel like punishment. 
But you got to believe that our loving Father, all He's doing is loving you back into His presence. Discipline is not God trying to pay you back for your sins. Jesus already died for that. You have to remember, He already died. Romans 8.1 says it best. I love this. Romans 8.1 says this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So as believers of Jesus Christ, right, you're not punished for your sins out of anger. You're disciplined out of love. God already punished his son for your sins, right, when he took your spot on the cross. All right, let me finish up with the fulfillment. And we're going to skip down to verse 57, okay? And we're going to finish this off with the birth of John. All right, 57 says this. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zachariah after his father. But his, his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, right, Zechariah, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue, tongue loosened and spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with them. So, Zachariah and Elizabeth's hope was fulfilled. They're welcoming a child at their old age. They're welcoming a child in their life. But again, not an ordinary child. It's a child that's going to prepare God's people for the coming Messiah. Now, you might say, well, that's all great and dandy. But Zachariah got what he got, right? I mean, he'd been, he prayed for a child and he gave up. But God gave him a child anyways. He was disciplined, couldn't speak for nine months, but, but he ended up with a baby boy. I'm still over here with an unanswered prayer. I'm over here drowning in my disappointments. How is this going to help me? Well, let me let, me, let, me let Zechariah answer that, all right? Because when he was able to, to start speaking, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began to prophesy, <laughs> and God inspired him to write this song. I'm only going to read verses 67 to 73. It says this. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our fathers, Abraham, to grant us. So two things here um, that I noticed. So the first of all, that God fulfills his plan on his time scale. <coughs> not our time scale, not your time scale, not my time scale, on his time scale. God said he was going to send a redeemer. That he's going to save his people. That he's going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, right? And the people waited and waited and waited. Over hundreds of years, they waited. But God is always faithful to, his, to the promises he makes to you. But remember, they're on his time frame, not ours. And you got to remember this. Most of his promises that he makes right, are not realized until eternity. Meaning the new heaven and new earth, okay? So until then, what do we do? We wait, and we pray, and we hope, and we continue to trust in the name of Jesus. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want you to notice is Zechariah's joy, okay? is focused first and foremost on the birth of Jesus, all right? It is not his son, John, right? It's gonna be the horn of salvation for God's people. It's not a, his son, John, that's going to redeem this world. It's not his son who's going to be the seed of Abraham. 
And it's going to be blessing the whole, all the families of this world. It is Jesus that's going to do that. He doesn't start prophesizing about his baby boy until after he speaks the name Jesus. And why? Because Jesus is the only hope for salvation for his people. And that's it. So for nine months, Zechariah could not speak one word. One word. At his age, he's finally going to get a son. And his son's going to be an amazing prophet. And instead of talking about how great his son, how he's so happy that he's going to have a son, what does he do? He prophesies and speaks the name of Jesus. He points only to Jesus. Have faith in the Messiah because he's coming. See, the best gift that God can give you is truly the only gift that can take away your pain, your sorrow, your sadness, your disappointment. And it's truly the only thing that can give you joy, that can give you real security. Not these things in this world. Not 401ks, not our children, not our families. None of that can give you the joy and real security that Jesus can. The best gift is God himself in the person of Jesus. We have to understand that. God is not just about giving you what you pray for, okay? Because he does, he blesses, but it's not just about giving you a family, a, a job, a, a house, a retirement, good health. Because if that's what you think, if you think God is all about that and you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm good now, all right? I have all the things I've asked for, so me and God, I'm good. You're missing the boat completely. It's about his son. It's always been about his son. It's about that we're sinners. And God loves you so much. He wants to be with you for eternity. And we keep messing up. We can't get it right. But he knows that. He tried to give us a chance, but we couldn't. So what does he do? He sends somebody to be the perfect sacrifice. And that's his son. He said, I'm going to give you a gift, God says. And that's my son, Jesus. And this gift I'm going to give you, it cannot be taken away from you even when you die. Jesus will be with you. And we have to remember that. That God has given us His Son. He has given us a Redeemer. He has given us a Savior. And that name is Jesus. Amen? So this morning... It is the first Sunday of the month. And like always, we do communion. And we do it because of the, new, of the new covenant that God gave us through Jesus. That he died for our sins. So we do this in remembrance of him. We do this because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of what I'm going to do. Take this bread as, as part of my body. Right? Take this wine as my blood. And of course, at that moment, they didn't understand. But we do. So I ask you right now, when you take part of, of communion, remember what Jesus has done for you. He's giving you a new place, a new home. He's giving you joy on this earth. Listen, you might be going through tough times or great times. He's always there. And if you're going strongly to do something, you really believe God is not there for you. Jesus is carrying you. He's carrying you right now if you're going through something. Don't think he's not there. He is there with you. He doesn't always take away that pain. Because remember, he knows what you need sometimes. And sometimes what we need is that tribulation. He didn't cause it. It is our sin. That, or somebody else's sin, but he's there carrying you because he knows you need him because he loves you. So as we do communion, remember what he's done. Get right with God again. If you got off the path, if God says something to you right now that just struck your spirit and the Holy Spirit is nudging you, and you know what it is, give it to him. Give it to Jesus. 
He wants it. You're not made to carry this stuff that we carry sometimes. We're not made that way. Get it off your shoulders. Give it to Jesus. So let me pray us back into worship and pray over communion. <sighs> Father, you're such a great God, Father. <sighs> Thank you, first of all, like always, for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your love, your, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for just the, the covenant that, you, that Jesus came on this earth, left his kingdom, and died on the cross for our sins. Thank you for this message, Father. As I know in this life, we, we are walking with you. And there's times that we go through things that we struggle that we feel like you're not there, that you're not listening to us, God. Father God, I just pray that we remember the story of Zechariah, that we, that we just continued to, to just be godly people, because at the very beginning, you said these people were, were just blameless, just following the commands, right? They were upright people. They were righteous in your sight. Father, help us to continue in that, Lord to be in the Word, to be in worship with you. Everything we do in our work, in our families, in our, in our own home, let's make sure that we take care of the house that we live in, that God resigns there, that Jesus is in that house. When people walk in that house, God, help us make that house be all about Jesus. Let us trust your plan, God. I know we're constantly being attacked by the world. We're being tempted by the devil, by society, how we should change, how we shouldn't go that route, because if we go that route, we're going to be Jesus freaks. We're going to be righteous people, they call us. God, they can call us whatever they want, as long as you stay with me, because you are the true God, the true Savior, the name Jesus above all names. But we struggle with that at times to trust in your ways. So I just pray for the Holy Spirit just to continue to work in us, to convict us, to speak to us, Lord, through, through worship, through, through prayer, through the Bible, through our brother and sister, our group, that they will call us out if that's what you want. But let our heart to be humble and receive that with love. Father, I want to pray over communion as well. We do this in remembrance of you because we are an obedient church. We're here to remember what you did, Jesus. That you took your body, took your blood. You didn't have to do it. Even for some of us that, well, for all of us that didn't deserve it. But even those that never accepted you, you still did it for them. So as we do communion, I just pray that everybody in this room just will get right with Jesus. Just open your heart. Let them speak to you. That's why we're here. We're broken. If you come in this room and think like nothing's wrong, everything's great, you don't need help, right, right there I'm telling you, ask Jesus to open your heart. We're not perfect. There's always room to grow. We should never compare ourselves to anybody in this room. We should compare ourselves every day to Jesus. And if you do that, you'll realize oh, you have a long way to go. But that's okay. Because he's there to help us in this life. We should be afraid to speak the name of Jesus. So I pray that you help us in that, Lord. Because I know we get scared. We don't, we're not sure what we're going to say. I just pray for the Holy Spirit just to come in us every day at work in our families. We love you, Jesus. And I pray for anybody in this room that needs prayer for anything. I'll be up here on the left side. Or if you want to come to the altar and just get on your knees and give it to Jesus, this is time to do it. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you thought you did, but maybe you did or you never have, whatever the case is, but if you feel the Holy Spirit telling you, no, you need to start, to today's the day you're going to accept Jesus really truly and you're going to follow Him. You're going to pick up your cross. Every day you're going to start picking up your cross because you didn't do it a long time ago. I'll be, I'll be glad to pray for you for that. I pray all this Father God, in the name of your 
Son, Almighty Son, Jesus. Amen, amen.